Hey guys, it's Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today's video is gonna be on conventional lab testing versus functional lab testing. I'm gonna tell you what to look for when you're doing lab tests and what, what the difference is, just so you can kind of wrap your head around it. Uh, before we dive in, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. Really appreciate it. Put your comment down below. Let me know what tests you've done in the past in regarding lab testing and kind of your thoughts on that, what, what you've experienced. I'll, I'll tell you mine working with thousands of patients. All right, so let's dive in. So first off, Lab testing can be very helpful. Now on the conventional medical side, most lab testings tend to have to go more into the pathological range for it to be a lot of value. It's like picking up things that are more pathologically out of balance. Now, my experience, there are a couple of tests that, that may not be 100% true for. So we may see things like vitamin D, you know, but conventional medicine starting to understand that the, 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 the 20, the rickets level of vitamin D in the in the mid to low twenties is probably not adequate enough, and people are understanding that you want to be probably you know forty or above, forty or fifty at least is a pretty good vitamin D level. So that's one marker that's pretty good. I would say things like C-reactive protein. People are starting to run more. Again, that's a marker of systemic inflammation. But you know we want to be less than one. A lot of times, conventional medicine is even okay around two or three. So that's another marker I would say that, that may be reasonable, but they're not quite on top of. Another one would be liver enzymes. Liver enzymes could be a good sign of early uh, fatty liver, right? Non-alcoholic fatty liver, not from drinking too much alcohol, maybe just too much carbohydrates and fructose and inflammation. That could be one that's decent. Uh, my, my favorites are going to be anemic markers, anemia. So anemia could be it's like abnormal red blood cell growth, and they could be overly big red blood cells from B12 and B vitamin and folate issues or it could be very small red blood cells due to low iron. So one's a microcytic, hypo, uh, micro, uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia. The other one's a macrocytic anemia, big, macro, big. So with the iron-based anemia, we tend to see lower RBCs, lower hemoglobin, lower hematocrit. And a lot of times that'll be picked up on a typical CBC. We also may run ferritin and iron saturation and TIBC as well. Those are other important markers that they may not run. So if you see a CBC with those off, that could be a good thing to look at and to look deeper on. Um, what are a couple other tests that I typically see? So you could look at your comprehensive metabolic panel. They have some markers for immune markers like neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. If we see neutrophils maybe in the upper 25% of the range, there could be a bacterial issue. Monocytes greater than 10, there could be some gut inflammation. Eosinophils greater than four, there could be some systemic allergy stuff, environmental, or there could be some parasites. So those kind of give you, you know, chronically low or high lymphocytes could be a sign of some kind of immune stress as well. So those kind of give you a couple of windows that other things could be going on. And again, most times those don't have to be pathologically high or low to kind of know something could be up. So it kind of just gives me a little more motivation. Okay, we're gonna run a test. Okay, we see some RBCs or hemoglobin a little bit low. We see some maybe vegetarian diet or excessive menstruation, right? We're gonna look a little bit deeper, run a complete iron panel, or we're gonna look and run a complete thyroid panel, not just TSH, right? because most conventional medical tests are just gonna be TSH for thyroid. Maybe you see it above two and a half or three, but it's not above four and a half or five like conventional medicine requires it. So we may wanna look deeper there, right? So these are all really good markers that we can kind of look at on your conventional medicine test and kind of go deeper. So most tests conventional medicine run are gonna be spit off of a, a CBC, a CBC, complete blood count, which will have like your red blood cells, hematocrit, hemoglobin, it will have like your MCH, your MCV, your MCHC, like how big your red blood cells are. So look at anemias. And then of course we have other markers such as like the metabolic panel, which may have uh, minerals like such as potassium, magnesium, calcium, right? Sodium may have things like anion gap or CO2, it may have your liver enzymes. Um, we may also add a lipid panel to look at triglycerides or total cholesterol or HDL or LDL. Again, the stuff, the cuff, right? But these are things that I, see, I look at and see every day. So this can kind of give us a good window. One of my favorite parts of the lipid panel is just looking at the triglyceride to HDL ratio. We want that closer to, to one or ideally two to one at least, right? Two to one would be like 
if trigs are 100, we want HDL to be at least 50, right? 100 divided by 50 is two, ideally closer to one. So like a 75 over 75 or a 60 over 60. My my um, trigs are about in the low 60s and my HDL are in the low 50s. So I'm like a 1.2, 1.1. So that's a good ratio. You want to be closer there. That's That goes high when there's insulin resistance. So it's nice to see these kind of tests that are already being run that you may already have. Maybe good to look at these and kind of give you a, a new perspective on how a functional medicine doc kind of looks at and interprets them. And when you start seeing markers on, on the outer edges, you take a moment to pause. You know, think, what does that mean? And I've done some podcasts on these topics where we kind of go more into depth. So take a look at those podcasts to kind of gleam some more information. Now, from a functional medicine perspective, we're looking at the conventional test and we're, we're gaining inference. Like what direction do we wanna go? What could this mean? What are some other conventional tests we may run to give us more information? That's step one. Step two, there may be more functional tests we wanna run. So of course, like for nutrition, we may run a intercellular nutrient panel, whether it's a spectrocell or an ion panel or a nutri eval or an organic acid test to look at how nutrients and how intercellular metabolic pathways are functioning. We may run a comprehensive gut test to look for gut infections, gut inflammation, immune markers, digestive markers. It can give us a really good window of what's happening in the gut. And of course, everything has to bottleneck to the gut to get absorbed, right? All your nutrients. We know 80% of your immune systems in the gut. So it can give us a lot of information. And then, of course, hormones are great. We, there's no substitute for a complete thyroid panel with antibodies. There's no substitute for a really good comprehensive circadian rhythm cortisol test, as well as adding in female hormones or male hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA sulfate, uh, estrogen metabolites. These are all really good tests that we can do to kind of get a window on what's happening with the adrenals, female hormones, male hormones, um, circadian rhythm, really excellent. And of course, there are other tests that we can do to get a window into heavy metals, which we know blood tests for heavy metals aren't adequate enough because it's not getting enough of a window into tissue burden. So if you, you lick some lead paint earlier that day, it may end up in your blood. But if you have chronic lead or chronic mercury from from storages over, over a lifetime, you may have to do a challenge test with some kind of a, a chelator. So it just depends. And then we have other tests like uh, mold or mycotoxin tests, which can be helpful that we may that will involve a urine sample. We may, we may use some glutathione to challenge that or provoke it. These are all very helpful tests that can give us a, a window of kind of, of what root cause stressors or issues could be happening upstream. So I always tell my patients, you know, we want to look at how the upstream systems, whether it's the hormonal system, body system one, which could be adrenals, thyroid, female or male hormones, could also be body system two, which looks at digestion and immune, right? Gut infections play a role in there. And then of course, body system three, which is detox nutrients and mitochondria. They're really important that play a big role in how your body functions. And of course, we also go upstream to how these systems broke down to begin with, whether it's underlying stress from Foods like, like chemical stressors, like gluten sensitivity, blood sugar imbalances, poor nutrition levels, poor digestion, infection. These are chemical. Emotional is pretty straightforward. It could be relationship stress, financial stress, family stress, health stress, right? Sick and tired of being sick and tired is a real stress. And then, of course, physical could be things like over-exercising, not moving enough, chronic pain, chronic inflammation, and we look at the upstream stressors, we look at the downstream middle of the road systems, how they're functioning, and then the systems then manifest themselves downstream into symptoms. And that's where the drug patch tends to come in where you know, the doctor's writing prescription for different drugs to control the pain or the inflammation, ibuprofen or female hormone symptoms, birth control pill, or the mood issues, antidepressant or benzo, or the tummy issues, Prilosec, right? Antacid or Tums, or the constipation issues with some kind of a laxative, right? So you can just go down the whole list and we want to go upstream, right? It's above, below, inside out, right? Want to look at the underlying stressors and systems and then look at the underlying symptoms down below by going up, okay? And now when you're looking at tests, when you're looking at these function, these conventional tests, we're still keeping that kind of model in the back of our head as we're looking at these tests and we're also going to be still looking at the underlying systems with some of these functional tests that give us a better window of what's happening underneath the hood. So I hope you guys enjoy that and that makes a lot of sense to y'all. 
Um, so in general, any other questions, feel free and let me know on this topic. We can always dive a little bit deeper. Again, I work with functional medicine patients from all over the world every day, and we kind of use that template to kind of dive in and figure out what's the next step, what's under the hood. If you want to reach out down below and connect with me or my staff and colleagues as a patient, feel free. There's a link down below where you can connect with me. Also, let me know your questions and thoughts on this topic. And we can dive into some live questions here on the spot. We call this improv functional medicine here. I'm waiting for my O test result. I had a GI map stool test and an MRT blood test. Cannot find the reason to my symptoms. Oh, well, that's sad. Well, you should reach out to me, Nicole, so we can dive in deeper. Uh, Abdullah writes in Dr. J, I have skin issues, dark circles under the eyes, anxiety for 13 years, and no crumping or diarrhea ever. No cramping or diarrhea ever, only chronic bloating. Could the cause be leaky gut or infection? Yeah, it could be. I mean, so when I look at patients, of course, the six R's with the gut play a big role, right? Removing the bad foods, replacing enzymes and acids, repairing the gut lining and hormones, right? Hormones come in there. Fourth R, removing the infection. Fifth R, population, good bacteria. Six R, retesting. So, Anytime I see dark circles on the eyes, I'm always thinking food allergy issues. So food allergies could be an issue. Um, also, blood sugar imbalances could be a big one as well. So we'd have to really look deeper. But leaky gut isn't a cause, it's an effect. So leaky gut's like a big kind of thing in, in functional medicine now. But it doesn't really help me. It's a good label because people feel good with the label, right? Even conventional medicine, that, that label, aka diagnosis, helps them get insurance coverage, it helps with drug prescription coverage. But in functional medicine world, it doesn't do anything for me because I work with patients via cash. So I don't need this diagnostic code for me to engage in care with the patient. So leaky gut is more of an effect than a cause. I look at the causes of leaky gut and we treat the underlying causes and then the effects that manifest downstream end up taking care of themselves. Dr. J, what's a good fasting blood glucose for someone in a low-carb, moderate protein, ketogenic diet? I mean, I would say somewhere between 80 and 120, you know, under 120 within that first hour and back below 80 to 90 within two, three hours would be great. Recently started a low-acid diet to help improve anything wrong with the esophagus. Oh, LPR. Uh, help... Uh, Recently started a low acid diet to help LPR. That's going to be laryngeopharynx reflex for people that are listening at home. Um, could that help with the esophagus? It potentially, I mean, the first thing I look at with LPR is what kind of inflammatory foods are you consuming, number one. And then are you able to digest those foods, number two. Now, of course, there could be other infections like H. pylori or SIBO. But yeah, get the food allergies and the digestion under control first. That's like super, super important. Can you tell much about liver enzymes through a simple CBC? I mean, if they're elevated, there could be some liver stress. It could also be because, because you exercise too hard before the test. So it could be helpful. I mean, if I see a lot of high enzymes, then maybe refer my patient out to an ultrasound. If they're not exercising, excessively, get an ultrasound to see where they're at. Um, gluten exposure, if really sensitive, can also cause an elevation in liver enzymes according to the Journal of Hepatology. That's also one component. Why do cancer patients have a lot of hair loss? Is it because of a ton of blood loss due to cancer, therefore causing anema, anemia? Well, most hair loss that you see with cancer patients is due to chemotherapy. It's almost always chemotherapy. Um, chemotherapy tends to kill cells that replicate and divide very fast. Cancer cells are one, and so is the gut lining and hair. So it tends to be more chemotherapy. Um, typically, if someone does have cancer and they, and they have hair loss, and they don't, they're not on chemotherapy, it just could be that they're under a lot of stress and their physiology is very catabolic. They're breaking down. And again, tissue like hair, skin, and nails tends to get sacrificed when you're under lots of stress. Like you see people, like they literally pull out their hair, like they literally lose like globs of hair when they get stressed. Yeah, I mean, because you really become catabolic and that's, you're breaking down way faster than you can build back up. But to allude to your question, that tends to be more of a chemotherapy side effect. Good questions, good questions. How do I fix um, my gut issues and water hydration as well as any thoughts will be great, thanks. Yeah, so six hours like I mentioned earlier. Again, if you have a specific question, I'd be happy to answer it, but if it's a general question, it's general questions, I, I point you to podcasts or, or general concepts. If it's specific, then I can get more specific. Typically have blood pressure of 120 over 80, but have recently dropped to 100 over 60. 
feel fine but wondering if I should look deeper at something. I mean, the first thing I do is make sure you're hydrated enough and getting enough minerals in your water. Uh, Dr. J, how do we fix all these things before you talk about this q and A? Um, not sure what the question is, though. So if your question is about gut issues, go go to the six hours I mentioned above or go to a podcast on that topic. If you go to justinhealth.com, everything is search engine optimized there. What causes leaky bladder? I mean, I'm not too sure about leaky bladder, but usually anything that causes gut permeability is going to cause bladder permeability. So I would look at bacteria potentially in the urinary tract that can move up to the bladder, any E. coli issues or just dysbiotic overgrowth or stress or food allergies like gluten could potentially be a driving factor. What causes indigestion and gut issues plus hydration issues as well? Well, I mean, first thing with hydration issues is just not drinking enough water. And then number two is you're not getting enough minerals in your water. So add some minerals in there too. And then what causes indigestion is just not being able to break down your food. So it could be a food allergy component to it, right? The food's inflammatory. It could be you're not breaking it down enough. Therefore, the food rots and ferments and putrefies. It could be an infection issue in the intestinal tract. Oh, you're totally welcome. Glad you appreciate it. Can SIBO affect pH of the stomach or be a stressor on the body? Yeah, definitely can. SIBO can definitely affect the stomach. I mean, any kind of... You, know, you can see like a glucose test, a glucose, like there's like a lactulose breath test. A glucose breath test could look more at bacterial overgrowth via the gases in the stomach. That's a better test for that. You can also just look at the gut and just see if it's a general dysbiosis and just assume that that's kind of on average happening throughout the intestinal tract or just look for H. pylori too. So I'll look at and run a comprehensive gut test and maybe run a breath test if needed too. Great questions. But anytime you have lots of stress, that could throw off acidity, for sure. Um, with, with a healthy gut, we're going to have good acidity. With inadequate gut health, we're going to probably be more closer to alkaline or at least above, close, more closer to neutral. B12 levels are always high, 1,200 to 1,300. But CBC always says large RBCs, 15 to 17 size, also MTHFR SNPs. I mean, serum B12 could be high if you're taking B12. So that's never a good test. So when you say CBC always shows large RBCs, what do you mean? Do you mean like the RBC numbers 15 to 17? Or do you mean like MCV or MCH? What specific marker do you mean? But the best marker for B12 is going to be methylcobalamin, transholocobalamin or methyl, I'm sorry, transholocobalamin is one. I think Quest runs that one. Or you could run a methylmalonic acid urine test. There's a urine and a blood. And Genova runs that on the organics. Also LabCorp, I think Quest also run that via blood or urine as well. So methylmalonic acid gets converted to succinic acid. It goes methylmalonic to succinic acid. And in that conversion, B12 is needed to make that conversion happen. So if there's inadequate levels of B12, methylmalonic acid accumulates and gets higher and higher. So that's a good test to look at functional B12 levels. Should I choose a caffeine-free tea? Any specific suggestions? I mean, green tea is still great. It's very low as long as you're caffeine, as long as you're not caffeine sensitive. Green tea is totally fine. If you want just a general tea, chamomile or ginger is wonderful too if you want non-caffeine as well. Yeah, organic lavender or chamomile is great. Chamomile is a, a, a kind of a digestive kind of bitter, so that's great. Uh, how do we fix the gut? So I answered that question earlier, generally speaking. That's... So these Q&As are always good for very specific questions. General questions are not good because I'm going to just point you to a podcast where I, I riff on it for like 45 minutes. So six hours, like I mentioned above, and go look at any of my podcasts on gut health to get a, a better window on that. Okay, so specific questions, general questions, I'm going to push you to podcasts. Um, you will always be available like this and keep your clients. I predict you'll be super famous in coming years. <laughs> That's funny because you're awesome and I want to make sure I stay in your mind. I appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, flattery flattery will get you everywhere with me. Just kidding. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, which specific over-the-counter test could I purchase to detect ovulation? So just go to Amazon or go to your local drugstore and just look for an OPK test. It's basically an LH surge test. So you can go on Amazon and just grab one that has really good reviews or go to your local Walgreens or CVS or Rite Aid and just add, ask like the person there, like which one sells the best. And that's just looking for an LH surge. And usually LH goes up one to two days before you ovulate. 
So, and it'll kind of tell you like some tests will have like smiley, smiley plus. So you'll kind of know when like fertility is starting and when per peak fertility is. And then that'll kind of give you a window. So Liz, if you're doing um, an, a LH search test to figure out where your luteal phase is, then just about one, seven days, six or seven days after that LH surge will be when your luteal phase is at peak and then you can do it then. If trying to fix LPR, good idea to go alkaline as much as possible for a while. Um, the cough is really bad. So that's a good question. I mean, your stomach's acidic, right? So everything that goes into your stomach ends up being massively acid. So it doesn't really ever make sense to go alkaline. I, I see people that talk about acid alkaline, I shift the conversation and say, no, 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 we should be talking about anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. That's the conversation because meat is technically acidic, but is meat bad for you? No, if you're eating good quality meat, there's lots of nutrients, gamma linoleic acid, omega-3s, some arachidonic acid, which is good, good cholesterol, lots of fat soluble vitamins. So there's a lot of good nutrition in there. Just balance it out with some good vegetables that are going to be anti-inflammatory and more alkaline too, right? But focus more on inflammation versus anti-inflammatory, right? Less grains, no grains, no refined sugar, processed foods, and see how you feel. You know, you can may even want to just try going carnivore, see how you do there too. Play around with that, see how you do, adjust your macros up or down, and then really try to do smaller meals, see how you do, get your enzymes and acids dialed in, and um, really pre-digest your foods and probably avoid raw out of the gates. Yeah, if you can't handle HCV or HCL, then you need to work on doing a lot more enzymes out of the gate and cooking your food really well so it's broken down and maybe more of a soup or stew-like so it's easier on your tummy, right? The more you cook in the crock pot or the Instapot, the less hard your tummy has to work. Dr. J, how do we fix uh, kidneys or adrenals? Too broad of a question. Can the varieties of fish create inflammation? Can varieties of fish create inflammation? Well, I mean, always try to go like, I wanna say pasture fat, but that's not the right word for fish, uh, harvesting a fish. Not free range, I think not wild caught, probably wild caught, right? Like not farm raised type of fish. So like wild Alaskan sockeye is great, or some kind of like good skipjack tuna. Um, some kind of a, a fit, get, buying a fish from a source that's going to be really, you know, more wild harvested. Uh, I have one link. Yeah, justinhealth.com slash seafood is a really good site I use. Um, they, they are really great for seafood, and we get a lot of our seafood from there. So that's a really good um, website for you, justinhealth.com slash seafood. That's, I think, Vital um, Farms is one of the ones I use there that has really good seafood. Suffering with adrenal fatigue when supplementing with tyrosine, 500 milligrams one time a day, but makes me feel anxious. Is that normal? So do it with food, do it with food, and start with a small amount and taper up. It, it could be some people, they need it and they feel better as they dose up. Just try it at one and then just kind of go up one capsule every day. Do it with food so it's more time released. Amino acids, empty stomach wise will hit you a lot harder. You'll, it's, it's like doing a shot of espresso versus like sipping a cup of coffee over a meal, right? It's kind of like that. So just kind of do that a little bit slower. That should probably help. All right, guys, excellent questions here so far. Anything else, feel free to let me know. Also, you want to combine that. So like, I don't know, James, where your adrenals are, are right now. So if you have high or low cortisol, if you're a patient, we probably already have, have you on a dialed in protocol. So make sure you follow that supplement reaction guide and add everything in one at a time. Adjust the dosing if you need, and then just go down the list. If you can't tolerate it, do your best and then move down the list, okay? Um, if it's sort of important to do AIP and low FODMAP, how important is it to keep the carbs down in addition? It just depends where you're at. You know, people that are really having a problem with like gaining weight, like they can't gain weight and they're losing weight, um, then having more carbs may be helpful along with more fat too. So it just depends upon where you're at with the weight. Outside of that, see how you feel. You know, my default is always start low and then go up. My concern is if you're kind of in the middle, you don't know where to go, right? And most people consume too much carb. So I always go low, kind of see where you're, you're sitting, especially if your weight's not adequate, and then you can taper your way up as you go. Any substitute for activated charcoal to help with detoxification? Yes, you could do uh, bentonite clay, you could do modified citrus pectin, you could do fulvic minerals, but activated bentonite clay, 
citrus pectin, those are all really good, easy ones out of the gates. So you just got to take those two hours after food and sups, one hour before food. Is topical retin, retin-A and hydroquinone right if we're dealing with internal inflammation? Um, topical retin-A, it, it can have side effects. So I recommend using a retinol product. Retinol is very helpful for decreasing oil from the skin. It's very helpful for collagen synthesis. Um, typically, like the um, tetracy- not tetracycline, um, what's the other one that's the, got the black label the dermatologist prescribed? Not Retin-A, not tetracycline, Accutane. Accutane's a vitamin A analog. That it kind of works similar. So I use the one in Marie Varadique's line, their Retinol product. It's more gentle. It's it's just, and then it's got some vitamin C and other like topical nutrients, more gentle. So I like that. Retin-A has a lot of side effects of redness. I'm not familiar with the hydroquinone. So pause on that one. And of course, yeah, fixing everything internally is going to be big, right? Getting the inflammation out of the food, getting natural vitamin A through cod liver oil and grass-fed meat and, and egg yolks, if you can do egg yolks now. Those are all good kind of things out of the gates. Got it. So you're right in the middle. Yeah, so just do your best. Figure it out. You know, start low, work your way up. Do you personally eat organic rice or legumes? I mean, I did have a little rice this weekend, and typically when I have it, it's with sushi, so I'll do like usually one sushi meal every month or two, and I'll have like a nice clean like, you know, California roll or Alaskan roll. So, you know, no imitation crab, right? That's where they get you is the imitation crab. Always make sure imitation crab, it's real crab because imitation crab is like pure gluten, right? And then I'll do like some MCT oil and coconut aminos, and I'll mostly do sashimi with my sushi, and I'll take charcoal and extra HCL and enzymes too. Um, but yeah, so I'll do it every now and then. And then when I do um, HCL, when I do any rice during the week, guess what? It's not rice. It's miracle noodle rice, which feels like rice in my mouth, but tastes really good. And it's glucomannan from a Japanese cognac game. Or I'll do um, I'll do rice in the form of cauliflower rice, which isn't rice, but it still has a really nice kick to it. And I'll put a little bit of coconut aminos on it for a little bit of flavor. Okay, very good. Um, MCH, low, 23, 26.3, MCV, 83, RDW, always high, hemoglobin and crit, always normal, platelets, always low. Um, hard to say. I would need to look at the other markers, um, Joanne, regarding B12. If this is the Joanne I'm thinking about, then I would want to look at methylmalonic acid, look at your organic acid levels. Uh, if lymphocytes and immune cells are on the lower side, then you know make sure the gut stuff is under control. And then we could also give you um, extra immune support and an extra B12 and folate if needed. But really focus on that methylmalonic acid as well. Is a multivitamin necessary for a manganese for good health? I mean, it depends where you're at. So I don't typically go and recommend manganese out of the gates, but if I see it on an intercellular test, we're going to make sure it's there. In a good multivitamin, typically some manganese may be there. Are there any substitutes aside from pasta, such as spaghetti squash, or on an AIP diet? Yes, you could do miracle noodles. I love them. They're excellent. Low carb, low calorie, wonderful. How do you feel about cassava, flour, pasta, and rice? Um, I like a little bit of cassava. I mean, it's in in the cheat category for me, right? It's a cheat category, but it's there as an option if I'm doing well, like for my AIP patients. It's a cheat category. Um, Rice... I would say a no-go until they're really doing great and really stable and it's something they're really craving and they've been great at their diet and great with their health. So if they were to have it and go backwards, they would know, then we have that. I I only want to push foods when people are doing really great that are questionable. That way, if they go backwards, it's like, I know exactly what did it. There's no guessing around. If you're kind of feeling like crap and then you're eating something and you're kind of still feeling like crap, then you're like kind of grabbing at straws, was that causing it or what? You don't know, right? What do you recommend to a past 50s with HTN and atherosclerosis, aorta? He's compliant to his maintenance. I just want to know more. Um, Help me out with the acronyms. I mean, I I could probably figure it out if I Googled it here, but give me the acronym so I can help. Uh, I'm about to cycle out using rice. Got to kick myself out of ketosis. So once I'm back in ketosis, my fasting blood glucose should be lower compared to higher blood glucose when I'm in gluconeogenesis. Okay, so is that a question? Okay, got it. I'm not sure what the actual question is, though. 
Um, very good. So RB, yeah, I need a little bit more feedback on HTN. I can maybe look at it here online and figure out what it is. HTN, okay, so hypertension, hypertension. So hypertension, atherosclerosis, so basically the, ar the arteries are narrowing, right? So what do you recommend? So things to help relax the heart. So the easiest thing is make sure adequate levels of potassium and magnesium are present, right? Magnesium is a natural beta blocker. The problem with a lot of the drugs for blood pressure, like a lot of the Lasix or hydrochlorothiazide or ARBs, they tend to lower a lot of these important minerals that are needed for the heart. So it creates more long-term dependence. So make sure magnesium and potassium are good, number one. And then also make sure um, you're getting enough of those minerals. And then make sure you decrease inflammation in the diet. It, cutting down the inflammation is very, very, very important. So gluten, grains, refined foods, all that stuff, getting that under control plays a huge, huge role. All right. Um, excellent, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed today's uh, chat. Please click down below, write a review, put your comments in the, in the um, comment section. Thumbs up. Really appreciate it. You guys have an awesome day. Take care, y'all. Bye.